Hello, everyone. It's Tuesday, September 27th. We have Mark Chaikin of Chaikin Analytics joining us on the show today. We'll talk about this market environment, where opportunities may be as this downtrodden market continues. Ladies and gentlemen, this is The Final Bar. Hello, everyone. Welcome to The Final Bar. I'm your host, Dave Keller. I'm the Chief Market Strategist here at StockCharts.com in a sunny Redmond, Washington. Thanks for joining us every weekday after the close as we break down the activity in the markets using the power of technical analysis. The technical toolkit is designed to help us understand market dynamics to better understand investor behavior and really respect the lessons of market history. A lot of the conversations I'm having recently with people like Mark Chaikin and others Talk about a historical reference, right? What does this feel like? What does this look like? When have you experienced similar periods? And what can we use from that experience to apply it to the most likely outcomes uh, today? As we often remind you on the show and market, analysis is not about certainties. It's about probabilities. So let's think about different scenarios, how they might play out, but focus on the evidence that the markets provide back to us. We have a great schedule of guests coming through. I'm excited to talk to Mark Chaikin here a little later in today's show. Tomorrow on Wednesday, the 28th, uh, we have Ms. Schneider of Market Gage. On Thursday, the 29th, Greg Schnell of Osprey Strategic coming to us from Calgary. Next week, by the way, is a fantastic event called ChartCon 2022. Today's guest and all of my guests this week are all participating in that special event. You can go to stockcharts.com slash chartcon to sign up for it today. Earlier today, I was talking with Mary Ellen McGonigal, Leslie Jufloss, Tom Boley, who are all participating in our interactive market outlook panel. Coming at the end of this week, we're going to be emailing out to all of our uh, stock charts users a series of questions. Where do you think the S&P is going to be at year end? What about Bitcoin? What sector do you think is going to work pretty well? What sector do you think is going to struggle? We're going to gather all of that feedback and use it to fuel our interactive market outlook panel. We will look at your responses. We will highlight what the crowd has said, and then have our three experts talk through their perspective and how to analyze the charts and come up with some good thoughts on each of those areas. One of the many fantastic events we will be featuring as part of ChartCon. StockCharts.com slash ChartCon is how you can sign up for that fantastic event. Let's continue on today's show with our market recap. Let's break down what the markets are doing. And again, as always, the technical toolkit is about focusing on the evidence, the information that the market provides back to us. Let's see what the market had to say today. The S&P down 0.2%, closing just below 36.50. The NASDAQ composite actually finished in the green. You can see today on the uh, on the market overview, just in the equity index, it's about 50-50, uh, positive and negative. The VIX actually pushed a little bit higher. It's just below 33. That is a compelling data point because all the major tradable bottoms in 2022 have experienced a VIX above 30. Now, while that doesn't tell me necessarily the fact that the VIX is above 30 is obviously today's the bottom, what it does tell me is we are seeing the conditions similar to previous bottoming phases, and it tells me to start looking at the evidence to focus on signs of uh, of strength. I don't know if we necessarily saw a lot of those today, but we'll look at the charts together, see what you can conclude as we look at the uh, the charts. Ten-year yields pushing higher yet again today. You know, if there's a story for 2022, I feel like there are a lot of different narratives, but key story is obviously inflation and interest rates and the relationship there, the, the, the movement higher of the 10-year yield from half a percent up to almost 4%. Didn't quite get there today, but really, really close. The peak back in 2018 was around three and a quarter. The high earlier this year, if I remember right, about three and a half percent. We're now well above those levels pushing uh, 4%. I'm often asked, right, well, isn't that enough, right? How high could rates go? Theoretically, rates can go a lot higher. And all you need to do is look at a deep history of interest rates to see that there have been much higher rate environments. If you look back at the last 30 years, rates are arguably still low relative to the long-term average. So it all depends on the time frame, uh, time frame you're looking at for sure. Dollar index essentially flat today, which is a which is a key one because risk assets have struggled in a stronger dollar environment. No real impact today there. Commodities sort of mixed and uh, and to be honest, mostly flat more than anything. Gold prices 
and silver price is about even. Same with copper, the ETF that we track there. Crude oil price is pushing a little bit higher, and the energy sector was certainly the strongest out of the 11. We'll get to the sectors here in a, in a few moments. All 10 of the most liquid coins that we track uh, in the crypto space, all in the red today, but not by much. By Bitcoin standards, this is an unchanged day. It's only down 1%. Ether down about 1.3% one, uh, 1 to 1320. I was asked earlier today, I did an interview with uh, Jared Blickray from uh, Yahoo Finance, and we were talking about a number of different things, but one of the things we focused a little bit on was the cryptocurrency space and just how to approach it from a technical perspective. And, and I have often said with any market on any time frame, focus on levels, focus on what I'd call the line in the sand. At what level does Bitcoin have to get where if you're not in that uh, market, you would think, wow, this is probably the point when I need to get in there. At what point would it break down where you'd say, no matter if I have a position and I'm really optimistic, I need to cut my losses. Think about what those levels are and focus on those levels. For me, 20,000 is an important one uh, to watch. And it's really interesting that we got just above there over the course of the last 24 hours, pushing back below it here uh, before we are uh, preparing for the, uh, for the show today. Let's go to a chart of the S&P 500 to sort of see where today's bar, today's candle fits into uh, the bigger uh, bigger picture. Here's sort of what things are, are looking like. If you look at the last, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six bars, you can see every one of those we close below the open. If you're looking for signs of optimism, I would argue start it simple. Look for a day when we close above the open. That's a really good place to start. Not close to close. That can actually fluctuate. And, and, and most of these days obviously close lower as well. But particularly looking at open versus close, that's a big part of candlestick analysis, to be honest with you, is thinking not just about the movement in the trend over time, but also about the day-to-day -day movements. Are we opening above or below the close? Or, or rather, are we closing above or below that day's open? A lot of the candle patterns that you probably know are driven off that dynamic, that by looking at close versus close and close versus open, you can get a good sense of what's happening uh, real time. So the last couple of days, we've arguably been trading down to around 36.50. That's a rounding error away from the low uh, that we saw in June, which is around 36.35. Today, we undercut uh, and made a new intraday low for the year. Uh, and uh, on a closing basis, we closed below 36, uh, 36.50 for the first time. So that is certainly a place to watch to see if we can follow through there. At this point, if you step back, at this point, it's setting up more like a double bottoming pattern, right? We're oversold, we're hitting previous support. That's a real question to see what, uh, what happens next. And if we break 36.30, we'll call it, which would be enough of a move down uh, below the, uh, the June low, then you have to think about further downside targets. As we've talked about on our show, 3,200 is sort of the eventual downside target we see as making sense. That's based in no small part on Fibonacci analysis that we've been, uh, we've been uh, referencing much of 2022. A lot of these dotted lines have all come from one of those discussions, and I've left them, uh, left them on my chart. But don't, I mean, remember, there is a, certainly a, a possibility that we bounce from here, that we bottom here. I think that's unlikely, but it's certainly possible. And what I've learned in this industry is think about what's unlikely but possible because the fat tail distribution, what that means uh, in books like Black Swan and others is unlikely outcomes tend to happen more frequently than you might expect when you're talking about financial prices. Just to finish off our market recap, wanted to talk to you about sectors. We have energy up 1.1% uh, outlier to the upside. A couple other sectors narrowly in the green, notably consumer discretionary, which was second uh, up about 0.3%. A couple sectors really dragged the indexes down today. Consumer staples down 1.7%, utilities about the same, and REITs down about 1.3%. Uh, uh, it's interesting to see what stocks work, regardless of what's happening. And what's interesting when I'm looking at the charts of, uh, of, the, of the biggest gainers in the S&P 500 today, that's what I'm seeing in this little market movers widget. And as a reminder, if you use our platform as a member, which I'd, I'd strongly encourage you, of course, to do so, remember on your dashboard, it can be customized to a, to a great degree. And to do that, click on the gear icon in the upper right. That's where you can add some of these other objects. If my page looks a little different than yours, I've customized this and tweaked this to sort of optimize how I'm trying to look at the world. Uh, but certainly you should, uh, you should do the same. So what stocks were up the most today? Cruise lines, which is a group that, you know, at times has certainly rallied, but has certainly been feeling some pain in the last week with five straight down days before today's uh, brief bounce. You have Mosaic, which is in the material space, uh, up a good amount, about 4%. Enphase, which is in that renewable energy equipment uh, group. Again, a real painful week and a bounce off of uh, off of those lows. Marathon 
uh, MPC in the energy sector, as I mentioned, the number number one sector today. So none of these those things that I just highlighted for you are breaking out or anywhere near any sort of breakout. They're coming off of pretty low levels. And that can be encouraging because I would say one, the, the, you know, the way that a market like this starts to rotate is you have to have things that have been beaten down starting to not go down anymore, right? You have to have things instead of making new lows, they stop making new lows, uh, as uh, as you would say uh, in uh, in terms how how do you learn to fly? You you try to hit the ground and miss. So some of these stocks will have to hit the try to hit the ground and miss doing so, right? And make a higher low. The concern I would have to wrap up our market recap is when you look at some of the mega cap names like Alphabet. They're hitting the ground pretty good, right? Instead of finding support at 105, at 102, at 103, something like that, Alphabet making a new low and not even holding at $100 a share, which is a big round number, which is sort of like a long shot of, can Alphabet just find a low at that point? It's going lower. So oversold, that could indicate that we're nearing a point where we see a bottom, but no evidence based on just today's trading that that's happening anytime soon. We're going to come back after the break and talk with Mark Chaikin of Chaikin Analytics. We'll see you in a minute. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to The Final Bar. This is Dave Keller here at StockCharts.com. We so appreciate you joining us every weekday after the close for our show. A couple of quick announcements before we get to today's guest, Mark Chaikin. First off, we welcome your questions. We're going to do a mailbag segment a little later in today's show, and we'd love to feature one of your questions in our next mailbag Friday of this week. You can get your questions to us via email, thefinalbar at StockCharts.com, on Twitter at FinalBarSCTV, and on YouTube. Put a comment below the video you're watching on our Stock Charts YouTube channel. We'll gather all those questions. Hope to answer one of yours live on the air on Friday's show. Also, go to StockChartsTV.com. We're so fortunate to have some exceptional, exceptionally knowledgeable and experts, uh, expert opinion coming through uh, Stock Charts TV. People like Mark Chaikin, Larry Williams, Linda Rashke, so much more, all available at StockChartsTV.com or on your mobile device. Just search for Stock Charts TV on demand. I want to welcome on today's guest, Mark Chaikin. Mark probably needs a very little introduction for all of you. I'm sure you've used his work in your own process. He's the creator of a number of technical indicators that we feature on the Stock Charts platform. He's the founder of Chaikin Analytics. Mark, it is good to see you and welcome to the show. Thank you, David. I think the best thing you can say about today's stock market is we're one day closer to the bottom. <laughs> I feel like we've had a number of those here recently, right? We keep getting we keep getting further and further along this journey. We're starting with a point and figure chart. I'm really excited that you wanted to wanted to start here. Talk us through what this is telling you about the current environment and maybe look forward a little bit there. You were just talking about whether we might see a double bottom in the market here. I, I think that's very optimistic because it would just be too easy. But the point and figure chart, which uh, starts at the October, at the uh, March uh, 2020 low, uh, is really sums up what we're looking at. We're looking at a market that's making lower highs and now lower lows. But that trend line from the bottom in 2020 comes in at 3,400. I think that's a pretty interesting target right now. That is ironically the previous peak prior to the, uh, the pandemic. Uh, decline. Mm -hmm. So 3392 was the peak and the trend line's coming in at 3400. That's a good place to look at your technical indicator. What a, what a beautifully poetic move that would be if we have all of this noise and then end up finding support at previous resistance. That'd be an interesting, uh, interesting way that this plays out. Now, uh, Mark, you and I have chatted a couple of times in the last week, and this chart, I'm really excited that you're going to share with us. This really comprises a number of different indicators. Can you talk, it through, uh, talk us through what this is and what it's telling you about the current situation? I created this about three months ago in stock charts going all the way back to 1980. It basically looks at the internals. So McClellan Oscillator, McClellan Summation Index, percentage of stocks above, uh, in this case, 150-day average. And then at the bottom, the percentage uh, called the bullish percent goes all the way back to Chartcraft in the 60s. And when you look at this chart, you really see the big picture. You see a market that rallied up to its 200-day average. This is a weekly chart, so it's a 40-week average. 
But I think the biggest takeaway from this chart for me going into today was the McClellan oscillator is at its lowest level ever. So here you've got an indicator that looks at the internals, advanced declines on an on a exponential smooth basis. And what that says to me is we haven't yet seen the bottom because you tend uh, to not even make short-term bottoms on your weakest reading. Now, it's gonna start ticking up a bit. So if we were to see an undercut of 3630, maybe we make a short-term bottom. I'm looking for the bigger low in late October. So if we do kind of continue on, I think that's, I mean, that, that lines up really well with the seasonality, right? That we'd have a, a bottom in October potentially. If we would play out that way, if we see further weakness for the next month, we'll call it, and then we start to see a rally. How do you navigate between now and then as an investor? Because this is inflection points are tough for anyone, but how would you navigate that from an investment perspective? Where would you be looking for opportunities and what would compel you to start to nibble it at, uh, at additional risk here? I'd be in cash uh, with a big percentage of my investment funds. And I would also be looking at energy. You know, we, mm. we have potential sabotage event on the Nord Stream pipeline that supplies Europe with natural gas. And the market has decimated energy stocks in the last six trading sessions or eight trading sessions. My favorite stock, EQT, we've talked about that, largest natural gas producer in America. I'd start nibbling again on energy because that problem is not going away in Europe. And what's happened is you've got people looking at the global economy and saying demand for energy, for oil and gas is going to abate because of worldwide recession that doesn't solve Europe's energy problems. So I'd be sitting on a lot of cash, but I'd also be looking at energy now because if I want exposure in this market, I want it in the energy sector. Mm. One of the challenges I've found, you know, talking to a lot of our, our users, many of them are new to investing. So they've not experienced a lot of bull cycle, bear cycle rotation. They just sort of, you know, the last couple of years is sort of their set of experiences. You've been through other periods where we've had inflation as an issue, where we've had, you know, a rising rate environment. What words of wisdom or what cautionary tales can you provide to newer investors on how to get through or how to navigate what would, it, and for a lot of people, is a very different look than they've seen from the, for the financial markets? Don't fight the Fed. And, <laughs> you know, someone said to me today, my, my uh, associate, Pete Carmesino, who has done a lot of great work on stock charts, he said, Mark, if you're not bullish on the bond market, you sh probably shouldn't be bullish on stock. Mm. But the, the, the analog to me, the most comparable period, 1973-4, inflation was rampant, energy prices were moving up, and that was a painful bear market. And there were a lot of rallies um, along the way, just like we saw here in the June-August period, like we saw into the May peak. And don't get seduced by the rallies. That would be my advice. Wait till there's an all-clear signal. Uh, there's some literature that says if you miss the 10 biggest days in history, then you underperform the market. Uh, that's great if you, if you don't have to sleep at night. So <laughs> I, I would say sell down to the sleeping point, meaning own what you're comfortable owning, no matter what happens, whether it's 3,400, 3,200, maybe 3,000. And be smart. You know, the heroes don't make money on Wall Street. <laughs> Mark, as always, you've packed a lot of investment wisdom in just a short conversation. We're so appreciative that you could join us. Stay safe there on the East Coast, and we'll talk to you again soon. You as well. Good luck with ChartCon. Can't wait. Thanks so much, Mark. That's Mark Chaikin. Mark's the founder of Chaikin Analytics. He mentioned Pete Carmesino as well. It works for Mark and does a great job. Hosts a weekly show on Stock Charts TV. And I encourage you to check that out. Uh, at stockchartstv.com. I love this chart that Mark uh, shared with us, by the way, and talking through some of these uh, conditions. If you look at measures of breadth, pretty negative McClellan oscillator is one we'll, uh, we'll uh, I think I featured as one of our three and three. I was putting it together before the show. We'll get to that in a bit. Great take there from Mark Chaikin, as always. Let's continue on today's show with the final bar mailbag. As a reminder, the mailbag is always open at the final bar at stockcharts.com. And here is question number one. Dave, last week, stocks having a scooter ranking below 10 were making upside moves, and stocks having a scooter ranking over 90 went down. So is, is a scooter ranking a useless indicator? I love featuring questions like this. And, and, and I tell you what, I, you were never going to offend me with questions that 
you know, bring, you know, any of the technical toolkit, any of the features, any of the tools that I show on the on the on the show, as long as we're respectful of one another, I've learned a lot from questioning what I see others pitching. So you're not going to uh, offend me on that. Uh, and so I appreciate the very honest and upfront question on that. So the stock charts technical ranking we refer to very often. It's featured uh, usually on the show because it's on uh, my main dashboard that I look at every day. I'm looking and reminding what are the top stocks using uh, the scooter rankings. And here's what I will tell you, having used the scooter rankings for, for years now, it is not a perfect system by any mean. And, and I would tell you, anytime you're modeling anything, if it is an alpha model, like, you know, I would generally describe the scooter rankings, as, you know, sort of trying to, uh, you know, rank order stocks based on price momentum, you're implying that stronger momentum means it's in a stronger position, most likely going to outperform. Weaker momentum means weaker position, most likely to underperform. Um, having said that, there's no guarantees, right? And Enphase has been one of the top stocks in our scooter rankings for uh, for quite some time, for much of 2022. You know, how do you measure whether or not this was successful? And themes like this have done very well, right? On a relative basis, I would hesitate to find, I think you'd struggle to find uh, many names that have had a better 2022 through uh, September than Enphase, uh, just a nice consistent uptrend. So I don't think it's a bad, uh, you know, it's a bad uh, representative note. Having said that, it got a huge haircut uh, over the last week, going from around 320 to down 270. That's, you know, 15%, 20% uh, at a clip. So I think it's more of a question of time frame. So what we're saying is, how does it, what does it mean that the best ranked stocks are doing poorly this day or this week? Does that mean the indicator is broken? You have to remember that the scooter rankings, the stock charts technical ranking, is driven off of three timeframes. The long-term timeframe is the biggest weighting. I think that's about 60% of the weighting. The medium-term timeframe, probably about 30%. The short-term, about 10%. I'm totally making up those numbers, but I'm pretty sure it's about that. Uh, I don't have it in front of me. By the way, we have an article on the scooter rankings. Go to the little magnifying glass, type SCTR. You'll get a lot of great uh, articles from Chart School and from our commentators featuring the uh, the scooter rankings. I don't think that's necessarily uh, tells you that it's broken. It does tell you about the dynamics of the market. And I have certainly found one of the ways to detect inflection points or certainly a change of character in the market is when the leading names in the scooter rankings are struggling in a certain week and the most beaten down names are working. And Mark Chaikin, before we went live today, was telling me about some of the uh, emerging tech names, right? Things like Peloton and Zoom and others. Some of those names actually had a nice bounce today on, on a day when the market was down a little bit. Some of those names actually had a pretty decent uh, bounce. Airlines bouncing higher today uh, among uh, among others. So I think it's more of a, a question of timeframes. I think it's important to see the longer term trends and respect those, but recognize when something might be different in the short term. A lot of times that can mean an opportunity in a long-term uptrend, but showing short-term weakness. Great question, by the way. Question number two, does stock charts provide a way to compute the correlation between pairs of stocks? Even better, does stock charts provide a way to determine the correlation among a portfolio? I love that question so much. So the short answer is uh, yes, we do. So if you bring up a stock I have, I think I have one that says correlation. No, I don't. There's an indicator down here. I was going to say, I thought I had a chart scout like this. There's an indicator down here called correlation. And if you put it in here, you have two parameters, the benchmark. So what are you correlating these prices to? So in this case, I'm doing a 20 period look back and I'm looking at this stock versus the S&P 500. Now, when you do it, it's charting the correlation coefficient of those two data series uh, for the last 20 days, whatever number that you put in there. If you remember your statistics, if you're not a stats person, that's totally fine. 1.0 would be a perfect perfect positive correlation, meaning these t these things tend to move together in similar uh, similar uh, momentum. A, a a perfect negative correlation would be minus one, meaning when this goes up one percent, the other thing goes down about one percent. And zero would basically be the absence of a relationship as defined by uh, the correlation uh, coefficient. It's a great way to look at the relationship between how closely a certain stock or sector is finding following some other thing, right? Look at energy stocks versus crude oil prices, gold stocks versus gold, two different global benchmarks, see how they relate to uh, to one another. Do we have the ability to do a correlation among a portfolio? We sure don't. And I will tell you that is on a list uh, with our developers. Hopefully soon we can uh, do that. We have a lot of cool ideas about improving the portfolio level analytics on uh, stock charts. It is definitely on the list. And thanks for adding that. Every, every time we get a request, it allows us to prioritize it a little bit higher. Next question, there is a set of overlays that we can add to indicators in sharp charts. And you sent an image with you. And thanks so much for that. You were actually referring down uh, here. So if you look below sharp charts, 
there's a section called indicators. And to the right, you can see overlay. And these are things that you can overlay onto the indicators. And your question goes on. It seems like the MACD, PPO, and RSI are not included. Would you ex please explain the logic behind this selection? Yeah, so basically what we found, and this is years ago, well before I was involved with Stock Charts, Chip Anderson, our, our founder, who really developed most of our, our platform and, and has now hired a team of developers to keep moving it onward and ever upward. Um, they had a set of indicators, which are all things that kind of are not overlaid on the price, but are indicators that often go below the price. You'd find them in a separate panel like RSI or MACD or something. But a lot of times when you're looking at RSI, you might want a moving average or some overlay right onto the indicator itself. So we have this overlay section because we often found people wanted to create an RSI and add a moving average or add a horizontal line at a particular thing or do some other indicator. We have a small group of indicators and it's just when they created it at the time, we had a series of overlays that made sense based on the way the system was uh, was structured. Right now, our developers are working on what we're calling Sharp Charts 3.0. This is the next iteration of our core charting engine. It's going to be really cool. In a lot of ways, it will look similar in terms of the final result of the chart. We find our chart images, particularly when you're sharing them or including them in a report or in a presentation, they look really, really good. We don't want to mess that up at all. We do think we could clearly upgrade the user interface, and that's where we're focusing on it, and also add a lot more flexibility. So doing different things with colors and shapes and scales and axes and labeling and allowing you to do indicators on indicators in an infinite number of combinations. I will tell you in ACP, we already have a lot of that flexibility already created. So you might want to check out the ACP platform to see if it allow, allows you to do some of those things you're looking for. But I will tell you the next edition of Stock Charts most likely will include uh, pretty much everything that you, uh, that you asked about. Thank you guys so much for those great questions. Keep them coming. We need to wrap the show and go to the three and three. Let's hit three charts in three minutes that tell the story of this market environment. Here is chart number one. I spent a lot of time earlier today looking at breadth measures. And the reason is because as the S&P is narrowly undercutting its June low on a closing basis, we've already made a new low on an intraday basis. We made a new uh, low for the year today. So I'm looking at measures of breadth to see if they're confirming what we're seeing with price, right? Breadth for me is confirmational. The price tells you fact that tells you where transactions occurred. It tells you where an index is at at any given moment. But breadth measures look underneath the hood. And it's always interesting to see if you get confirmation by breadth indicators doing the same thing as you see from price. Here's the S&P undercutting its June low on a closing basis. That has happened this week. And I would argue that is one of the many signals that further downside is most likely. One of the exclamation points on that thesis are all four of these cumulative advanced decline lines as of today, now below their June or July lows on a closing basis as well. So just like price is broken down, the uh, advanced decline lines have broken down. It's worth noting, one thing that is not below its June low yet, the NASDAQ. So keep an eye on that chart. So our, our new Dow theory, not quite giving a sell signal just yet. Second chart is the McClellan Summation Index. I thought uh, Mark Chaikin did a great job of describing some of the uh, breadth measures that he tracks. And I love that chart that he shared. Uh, sort of reminds me of, of the one we refer to called the chart, just to highlight some key metrics to follow. He caused me a conversation I had with him last week preparing for Charcon, made me think a lot about the McClellan Oscillator and the McClellan Summation Index. I just want to bring up the fact that the McClellan Summation Index first went negative in August of last year, but just for a day or two, really went negative in September of last year. So you can see as the S&P was making a new high in November, even into January, the McClellan Summation Index was actually well below the zero line in December. It was one of the many indications telling you to be suspect or to be um, you know, skeptical of the rally that you saw in the S&P uh, into January of 2022. From there, the McClellan Summation Index has spent most of 2022 below the zero line, except for mid-July, late July, when it finally got above zero. That was one of the many things that told us this August rally might actually get somewhere much further to the upside. Stalled out at the 200 date, as you remember, very quickly, about a week or two later, got back below the zero level where it remains. The Summation Index remaining below zero tells me the uh, opportunities for the upside are limited until you see a rotation higher in the McClellan Summation Index. Finally, I mentioned uh, talking with uh, with Jared uh, Blickray over at uh, Yahoo Finance today. I think that'll be posted here very soon. Uh, and we talked about Bitcoin. One of the things I wanted to highlight is a potential bullish momentum divergence, lower lows in September on Bitcoin, higher lows in momentum. Is that a sign of a bottom for Bitcoin? I want to see more upside in that chart. First, ladies and gentlemen, that is a wrap for this show. Special thanks to Mark Chaikin joining us from the East Coast for StockCharts.com in Redmond, Washington. I'm Dave Keller. Be safe. Have a good night.
Hey, Grayson Rhodes here with Stock Charts. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, consider giving it a like down below, maybe leave us a comment, and if you're new to the channel, you can subscribe at the link up above. We're gonna bring you daily content from an incredible collection of technical analysts and financial experts.